Welcome back to the AI Daily Brief. We have had a lot of big macro sort of narrative discussions this week, trends in how people are thinking about the AI industry overall, questions about an uncertain future and what it means, not to mention more bubble talk than you can shake a stick at. So I have to say I was quite excited to have an actual product announcement to cover today, with the product that I'm referring to, of course, being Google's Pixel 10. Now, as much excitement as there is about the future of AI devices and whatever Sam Altman and Johnny Ive have cooking over in San Francisco, the reality is that for most people, they're going to experience AI and AI features first, probably through their phones. For normies at this point, mobile is by far their most important computing experience. And that is, of course, why it seemed like Apple's whole AI strategy or Apple intelligence strategy, as it were centered around bringing actually useful, simple AI-enabled experiences to regular consumers via the iPhone. That was the promise, at least, but as it's happened, it has just been delay after failure after delay after failure, ultimately underwhelming and leaving Apple farther behind than ever before when it comes to this AI race. Now, Google has so many things going on, not only in the AI space but beyond, but even just in the context of their AI efforts, Something like their Pixel 10 announcement almost got buried compared to everything else. In fact, as you'll hear, a lot of the discourse, at least from the AI insiders, was all about sadness about something that didn't seem to be released. In any event, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the Pixel 10, what features it has, what people are excited about, how they're discussing it, and what it means for the state of AI hardware. Now, the reality is, Google's AI rollout to the Android ecosystem has been an ongoing project. Gemini has been enshrined as the default assistant for several months, and there have been numerous little integrations here and there. This release, however, is not part of that incremental rollout. It is instead a complete overhaul of Google's flagship handset in both hardware and software to be AI first. And if you had any doubt about how the market was receiving this thing, the very first line of the Wall Street Journal article, entitled, by the way, Google is beating Apple on smartphone AI, was this. The race to develop the killer AI-powered phone is on, but Apple is getting lapped by its Android competitors. We'll come back to that discussion, but let's first talk about the features. One of the big ones is called Magic Q, and that's the name they've given to Google's agentic assistant. It can rifle through your apps to find certain information and offer context-sensitive assistance. For example, if a friend texts you to ask where you made dinner reservations, the assistant will search your calendar and deliver the information in a pop-up. Initially, the feature, it sounds like, will be limited to Google's family of apps, but given that they have Calendar, Gmail, and so much more, there's still quite a few integrations there. In the context of that Apple competition, this was obviously core functionality that was promised with Apple intelligence but was never delivered. What's more, when it comes to the user experience of AI, a small but important point is that the feature is going to run as a passive AI service rather than needing the user to prompt it. Next up, we have a feature called Visual Overlays that can use the camera as a live input for AI queries. Google showed an example of pointing the camera at a pile of metric wrenches to see if anyone will fit on a half-inch bolt. Now, on the one hand, this is sort of table stakes. This is the type of thing that people have been excited about with ChatGPT for a while. But obviously, the integration directly into the operating system brings the utility of this type of feature to another level. Another feature is that the Gemini Live AI will be able to detect your tone. For example, being able to figure out if you're excited or concerned and adjusting your outputs to match. And this, I think, gets to one of the most important underlying subtext of this whole launch, which is that this is basically all about exploring how much new and important context the mobile interface can provide when it comes to AI assistance. When you're prompting a regular generic chatbot, you have to provide all the context yourself. In other words, you have to explicitly type or say via voice what you're feeling, the type of output you want. You have to explicitly share with it context from other documentation. Now, yes, that is changing a little bit as memory becomes a more important part of these systems, but by and large, each prompt is tabula rasa when it comes to the context that you might want to bring to it. Your mobile device, though, is one big bucket of personal context. Mobile devices are our command and control centers. They have information about our friends. They have a record of what we've been doing, what we've been looking for. All of these systems potentially give any sort of AI that's interacting with you via a mobile experience more context that can be used to make the output better. So this tone detection, for example, is another expression of using the particular form factor of mobile to get more context. But really, I think the important thing is that underlying idea of being able to get more context. There's also a live translation feature for phone calls, an AI-enhanced note-taking feature, and several other minor quality-of-life additions. 
Basically, it sort of sounds like Google took the Apple intelligence announcement video from last year and actually built all of the tech. Still, maybe the thing that's generated the most conversation so far is the camera and photo editing suite. The core offering that Google is promoting is a feature called Camera Coach. It does things like tell you how to properly frame a photo, give an interesting photo suggestion, and automatically choose the best picture from a series of shots. One of the big features getting a lot of attention is 100x zoom. Google shared a demo of a full-frame photograph of a car, then showed that the photographer had taken it from nearly a mile away. The interesting thing here is that this is actually a sneaky AI feature. Instead of achieving this with optical lenses, Google is using AI to generatively fill in the details as you zoom in. It's basically a sci-fi enhanced tool. Now, because this is AI, not optical, it does feel like the sort of thing that we'll need to get our hands on to know how useful it really is. But if you're looking at the trend lines, it's still interesting to note that Google is starting to use ImageGen for live camera use. The other big photography feature is AI picture editing, which Google is calling Edit by Asking. Now for this, you prompt the AI to edit images as we've come to expect from these modern models. Google gave the example of removing the glare, brightening the photo, and adding clouds to the background to show how specific you could get with this. But it also showed how you could go more generic, taking an older photo and simply saying, restore this old photo. You can also apparently do the old prompting trope of just asking the model to quote unquote make it better, and you'll get a decent result. Now, to the extent that this announcement had some disappointments, the big one was that we didn't get any explicit word about Nano Banana. Nano Banana is an image generation model that was released in stealth on LM Arena earlier this week, and as we discussed yesterday, had been absolutely blowing people away. People were especially impressed by its ability to do very precise edits with incredible model consistency and prompt adherence. Now, even before this, people pretty quickly started to suspect it was a Google model, which seemed to get confirmation when a number of different Googlers, including Logan Kilpatrick, started tweeting out just the banana emoji. And yet, when the Pixel launch came and went without any sort of explicit banana reveal, there was a fair bit of frustration on the timeline. David Morey wrote, Okay, let me be honest. Am I the only one underwhelmed by Google's event today? I was expecting more from Gemini, like Gemini 3.0, Notebook LM improvements, the Nano Banana release, etc. In reality, they've just announced features seen a year ago and small improvements for daily usage. Where's the big thing we were expecting? Is this the OpenAI contagion? That said, to some people, the edit by asking feature looks pretty close to the capabilities of Nano Banana, meaning that it's possible that we actually did get a new state-of-the-art image generation model, just not a formal announcement. And I think that to the extent that that is the case, which I'm not sure about, it does make a particular sort of sense in how Google was approaching this particular announcement. Those of you who are listening to this show are used to following AI model announcements like it's a sports league. And some of the events that we have, such as Dev Days or Google I.O., are exactly catering to this audience of us. The Pixel 10 announcement wasn't that, though. This was the rollout of a new flagship phone. In fact, if you need a sense of just how normy it was supposed to be, it had Jimmy Fallon hosting the event. There's probably not a realistic world in which Google is going to get Jimmy Fallon to explain why the editing feature is called Nano Banana or mention that codename anywhere near a product aimed at the average consumer. By the way, for what it's worth, and for the completeness of coverage, people did not love the Jimmy Fallon aspect of this. Summing up a lot of people's sentiment, TechCrunch's Sarah Perez wrote, Google, sorry, but that Pixel event was a cringe fest. Sarah writes, the awkward event made Google feel out of touch. It also suggests that the company felt it needed buzz to cover up for the lack of tech advances, which is not the case. Basically, they were arguing that there was enough tech here to not need this sort of celebrity production. They write, Instead, it went for buzz with paid celebrity appearances, including event host Jimmy Fallon and others like Stephen Curry, podcaster Alex Cooper, the Jonas Brothers, and more. The result was a watered-down, cringy, and at times almost QVC-like sales event, which Reddit users immediately dubbed unwatchable. Joan O'Tan wrote, I used to wish Apple would bring back live presentations, but after watching the Pixel 10 event, turns out they made the right call keeping them recorded. Again, I think what's relevant for our audience is not a critique of the particular marketing efforts here, but an acknowledgement of the intention of the audience. This is very clearly aimed at a general consumer audience. Moving back briefly, though, to one more thing that matters to this particular audience, a feature that's going a little under the radar is that the phone is powered by Google's new Tensor G5 chip. The chip features an AI core that's 60% more powerful than its predecessor. Google claimed this allowed them to run all the AI features on device powered by a version of Gemini Nano. Google actually took a hit on overall performance by using this chip, meaning that they're making a big bet on on on-device AI. Now, Google's custom AI silicon is starting to get more attention. The latest generation of their Trillium TPU seems to be delivering some impressive performance for AI inference, and Google has started to ramp up their orders with TSMC. 
On a recent podcast appearance with A16Z hosted by Eric Torenberg, Dylan Patel of Semi-Analysis talked about how the biggest threat to NVIDIA is this sort of custom silicon that companies like Google are doing. It's the biggest thing, right, is um, when we look at orders from Google and from um, Amazon, right, especially, they're and, and Meta, their custom silicon is, not, not Microsoft, their custom silicon kind of sucks. Uh, but the other three, they're really upping their orders massively over the last year. Um, you know, Amazon is making millions of Tranium. Google's making millions of TPUs. Mm. Um, TPUs clearly are like 100% utilized, right? Yeah. Um, Tranium's well. not there, but I think Amazon will figure out how to do that. Um, and Anthropic will. Um, so, so I think I think that's the biggest threat to Nvidia is that people figure out how to use custom silicon more broadly. Now, what's interesting about this again, connecting it back to the broader Apple conversation, which started it, is that while it's always been Apple's strategy to own the entire stack, because they haven't been able to actually compete on the AI models themselves, Google now has a much more integrated AI stack of a type that honestly would make Apple of yesteryear jealous. They're making the chips and the devices to deliver their own models direct to consumers. And so maybe that brings us back to wrap up to the question of how much it actually matters for Apple. Google was clearly gunning for Apple intelligence with this release, mirroring all the features they couldn't deliver on, Google's head of devices, Rick Ostero, even took a not-so-veiled swipe at Apple during the launch event, saying, there has been a lot of hype about this, and frankly, a lot of broken promises too, but Gemini is the real deal. The really interesting question is that right now, we simply don't know how much AI features actually can drive iPhone sales. Remember, despite breaking their promise on AI Siri and delivering a very underwhelming iOS, Apple's iPhone orders have actually gone up. There's also the fact that that if we want a really clear expression of the sort of gap between Silicon Valley's take on AI and everyone else's take on AI, look no farther than general consumers talking about these devices. Reddit, for example, absolutely hates AI. And because of that, they've been loudly complaining about the Pixel 10. In fact, you're seeing a bunch of posts where people who are genuinely excited about the features and who don't have a stake in the AI culture wars being kind of confused about why people are so angry. One post was called, There's too much hate on the Pixel 10. It reads, so I know a lot of you guys don't like AI or anything that has AI, but aren't these new AI improvements on the Pixel 10 genuinely just a nice new feature or improvement? It seems like people just default to thinking the product is bad as soon as they see AI in the marketing. Look, when it comes down to it, the mobile handset wars are about much more than AI features, as much as all the companies are focused on those features as their new storytelling. For a shocking number of people, it's just about what color your messages bubble is. Branding, my friends, is a powerful, powerful force. But still, it's pretty undeniable that Google is now delivering on a lot of the features that Apple seemed to indicate that they thought would be important to the average consumer who only cares about performance and outcomes and not whether something is called AI or not. It'll be interesting to see if and how this changes the balance of handset buying in the market. But for now, that's going to do it for today's AI Daily Brief. Appreciate you guys listening or watching as always. And until next time, peace.